This is Evangelist Charles Kruger. Welcome to tonight's Love Born Live. It's Christmas. Christmas came early tonight. <laughs> I've got my Christmas trees at early. I don't know. They're selling it in the shop, so I got the Christmas tree and I think it looks amazing. Get some color. <laughs> I love the color. Well, it reminds me of the cross. Amen. I don't know. Some people have all kinds of ideas about Christmas trees. I don't know any of that. I just like the lights. I just like the colors. <laughs> but uh, I don't have any sentimental value about it. But I like it. It's beautiful. And I, and I, maybe it represents the cross, you know. He that hangs on the tree. Cursed is he that hangs on the tree. And Jesus came and he hung on the cross of Calvary. And took our curses upon him. So that we don't have to walk around cursed. We can be blessed. Amen. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. <laughs> Amen. Now, take the messy norach with the clocky and all this. Amen. I'll, I'll be looking out for one. Sure. <laughs> Maybe you want to send me one. Anyway, guys, bless you. I plead the blood of Jesus, Father. We plead the blood of Jesus over every person, every profile, every comment, every prayer request, Lord, every prophetic word request. Lord, everyone represented on this. Lord, every family and household, every business and ministry. Lord, all, all people that's represented by the, by the ones that's joining in this live and the rerun. Father, we plead the blood. We plead the blood of Jesus over me. We plead the blood of Jesus over Loveborn. We plead the blood of Jesus over our past, our present, our future, our spirits our souls and our bodies in Jesus mighty name. Amen. Thank you Lord. Celeste bless you. Jean bless you. Get your hot chocolate ready. I feel like, you know what, here in South Africa it's hot. It's not cold. But what is Christmas without hot chocolate? <laughs> so, you know. So yeah, I, I like my hot chocolate. And this was only a recent development. Now I've started mixing it with oval team. I enjoy that. The Lord is good. Thank you, Jesus, that we can enjoy things. We can enjoy life. Get your communion elements ready. I've got some anointing oil here tonight. And we're going to launch into the unknown. I'm going to talk tonight, or the Spirit of the Lord will give us a prophetic teaching. Uh, concerning the unknown, when you go into this presence, the presence of the Lord, the, the present presence, the Shekinah glory, there's an element of the unknown. There's an element of mystery. There's a, an element of surprise now, <laughs> in a good way, probably. You know, there's, there's always a revealing in the presence of the Lord. And so, never a dull moment, and not one time when you seek the face of the Lord, you enter the glory, is it the same? It's not the same, but it's the same. Same, same, but different. <laughs> same, same, but different. So, it's, it's, there's an element of the unknown. And, um, while we're praying and while we're talking about the unknown tonight, I really don't know what I'm going to say, what, what the Lord's going to show through us, uh, to us through this prophetic broadcast. But I believe that um, God will answer prayers and change lives like He always does. I trust Him for that. If we can't trust the Lord for intervention, and change and turn around in our lives you know then what what are we doing he didn't say seek my face in vain there is purpose to the presence of the lord but there is the revealing in the presence of the lord where our eyes open up and we see the mysteries revealed maybe there's plans and things for your life that god has ordered and ordained for you and predestined for you to walk in and before worked out for you to walk in these good works. And when we are in the presence of the Lord, these mysteries are revealed. Jesus said, what I see my father do that I do, what I hear him say that I say. So he went up into the glory, into the presence, and he had fellowship with his father. And he comes down the mountains or the place where he used to pray. There was places that he frequented in prayer, that he frequently visited. He, um, the word says that as was his custom, he went to a certain place to pray. And um, so he, he returns to the people and then he says, I do what I see my father. So there is an element of revelation revealing the unknown, the mysteries, the hidden things. God likes to hide things. He, he, he likes to do that, but he likes to reveal them too. Amen. 
So, so there's a seeking, there's the glory. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to seek it out. Am I misquoting that? Probably. <laughs> Where, where's that scripture? Can anybody Google that? It's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to seek it out. Let's see. Let's read that piece. Uh, if anybody can Google that and put the scripture reference in here, we, I'll sure enjoy, um, appreciate that. That's so good. Hallelujah, man. It's Christmas. Christmas came early. Celebrating Jesus. It's Christmas every day if you actually think about it. There's those fu funny feast days and, and uh, we're, free, we're free from feast days and the law and certain things. But you know what? Just because Jesus fulfilled the Sabbath and he's the Lord of the Sabbath doesn't mean you don't need the Sabbath rest. But you enter it every day of your life. You abide there. And so we're celebrating Jesus. Amen. Glory, glory, glory. Bless you, Hillary. Bless you, Louisa Seymour. Hello. From, from Barfus, Genovia. From where are you again? It's Louisa. Celeste Becker, bless you. Proverbs 25, too. Thank you. I like you guys. are awesome. Proverbs 25, too. I am very interested to hear what the Lord is going to say tonight. 25 2 yeah Proverbs 25 verse 2 it is the glory of God to conceal a thing but the honor of kings is to search out a matter let's read it in the Amplified it's going to say the same thing it's the glory of God to conceal a thing but the glory of kings is to search out the thing it's, the word says it's your glory the glory of kings to search out a matter. Amen. And so we're on a two-week journey into the manifest presence and to, into the secret place. And this is not just, it's just starting off. It's like an introduction into the present presence and the manifest presence and Shekinah glory of God. Two weeks. After two weeks, what happens? We go on <laughs> forever. Amen. So it's a journey. It's, it's an it's a eternal journey. The eternal journey. The eternal journey into eternal life, rediscovering, or not rediscovering, but discovering new revelations of Jesus, the word revealed. And there must be an element of expectation and anticipation when you go into the presence of the Lord. There's too many dull services and boring church services. That's why the young people don't want to go to church. It's everything is routine and the routine has its place. But there must be an element of the unknown and the unfamiliar and uncharted territory. There's something in God that draws out an exploration like a thirst, a thirst for life, a zeal that consumes you, a passion. You've got to live. There must be life. There's got to be a thirst for life. You, it's not a dull, boring, monotonous thing. Um, if that's the right word. It's something, there is a hunger inside of you and it's a hunger for a thrill. Believe it or not. They say, there's a saying that says, um, we don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing. Can you imagine, can you remember when you were a child, how you would live yourself, your imagination was wild. You would live yourself in, you would play a game and you would just live in that. And you were there, man, you were like there. Whatever games you play as a child. Then we must not, now the Lord says, unless you are like a child. You're not going to enter the kingdom of God. You, you, you've got to be like a child. Not childish, but childlike. And there must be a, an expectancy and an anticipation of the unknown. Like a thrill. Like a... What do you call it? Something in you is one that, that's not just hungry... Like in a sense that you're desperate for food. Otherwise you're going to die... He says, I will satisfy you. Those blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. That's the word of the Lord. He comes, he's the bread of life. He says, if you drink of this water that I give you, you will never thirst again. But there is still a hunger and a thirst, but it's not a desperation. 
The desperation should not be part of the Christian life. There is no desperation because it's the finished work of the cross. Make your request known with thanksgiving. In other words, the desperation must be taken out of us. But the hunger is, is more to do with, with an anticipation and an excitement and a, a desire in you. It's better to, to it's a better better word to, to, to call it the zeal of God consumes you. There is a zeal. There is a fire. Fan the flame of your first love. Don't let the flame of your first love grow cold. There must be a fire and there must be new things. There must be adventures in God. And I believe that more than ever before, before the and the right at the brink of the greatest harvest of souls that the world has ever seen. We are going to, God is going to awaken a, a zeal inside of us and a sense of adventure because this prophetic evangelism movement is an adventure evangelism movement. There's, there's fun things, there's crazy, there's awesome things, but it's, and it's not always fun, but it's real. It's not, it's, it's real and it's like wild and, and, and you know what? God is really wild. He can be so wild that you tell him, Lord, ease up. This is too much. And he can take you on a, on a journey and on a ride of your life, on a thrill ride of your life. There's so much work to do in the ministry. There's not a lack of work to do in the ministry. You, you work your fingers to the bone in ministry. I mean, if you really want to know, oh Lord, what must I do? What is my calling? Where must I function? Where? Just start somewhere. This pick one, pick pick an area, and just start helping, and just start working, and pray for people, and prophesy, and let the Lord lead you, and open your mouth and tell people that Jesus loves them. But there's an adventure side to evangelism, and there's an adventure side to the presence of the Lord. But it's it's a thrill, and it's wonderful, but it's scary. If I can put it that way. There is something about launching into the deep. Into the unknown. Into a place where you can't stand. Where you, where the waters are above your head and you've got to swim. And the current takes you. There's something thrilling about it. But something scary about it as well. Knowing that he is your rock. Knowing that He is your anchor. Knowing that He is your stability and your security. And nothing can separate you from His love. And nothing can pluck you from His hand. If God is for you, can be a greater is He that is in you than He that is in the world. You are totally safe and secure. He hides you under the shadow of His wings. He keeps you as the apple of, your, of, his, of His eye. But that doesn't mean that your life is going to be dull and boring. You've got to live every day and every day every adventure with jesus says this is the day that the lord has made i will rejoice and be glad in it there's something about that and that that is an element to worship that you can't replace that you can't there has to be an element of the unknown and the element of mystery I've been in many services and I heard Tom Scarella, evangelist and revivalist Tom Scarella was talking about this, the element of mystery. When you come near men and women of God, when you come into ministries where the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk and things happen, when you come in the ministry of Jesus, there's an element of the unknown and the element of mystery that we cannot, you can't put your, you, it's, it's beyond. He spits in the ground, he makes clay, and he rubs it in a blind man's eyes. He turns water into wine. Hmm. He calms the storms. He walks on water. Why? Why did he walk on water? Why? And one of the most beautiful pictures and parables, well not parables, the story, the picture of Peter getting out of the boat and walking on the water with Jesus. And you can say what you want about Peter sinking, but he still walked on water. The other guys were in the boat. It's easy to criticize people when, they, when they're walking on and they sink, you know. But Jesus is right there and Jesus picked him up and he pulled him up. 
And Peter stood again on the water and he walked back with the Lord to the boat. <laughs> or maybe he walked, I don't know where he walked. But Peter got out and he walked. And yes, he did sink, but he walked. He's still the only guy that walked on water with Jesus. Amen. In the, in the New, Test New Testament. <laughs> so anyway, so here, here's the other guys and they sit in. But there's an element of the unknown. There's something that happens. Imagine Peter there. And he needs to get out of the boat. I mean, imagine how you get out of a boat and put your foot. And how did he do that first step? He put the, I mean, did he test it? Or did he just jump? I don't know. I don't know. I think he tested it. Jump, maybe. And he walked on water. But there's something, there's something of a mystery about that. It's a mysterious thing about it. It's a, go and wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Oh, and then there was the angel that stirred up the waters in the pool of Be Bath of Bethesda. And the first one that was in got healed. What? Why? I don't know. It was a mystery. It's an unknown. This Samson, don't cut your hair. If you cut your hair, you're going to lose your strength. Why? There's no scientific reason for that. Pro promise you. I'm growing my hair and I... I don't feel any stronger than, than, than before. So, Samson, grow your hair. Don't cut your hair. Why? What is the mystery behind it? What is the... Sure, there are many reasons and people want to figure it out. And they try to put God and label things. And sometimes you just got to accept that things are a mystery. Sometimes we just... We can't answer everything and explain everything. And people these days want explanations. They want to answer everything. But you can't always answer the things of God, the things of the Spirit. You don't know where the wind is coming from or where it's going. And this is like that, those who are in the Spirit. He says that these are they that are led by the Spirit. It's like, it's like, the, they're like the wind. You don't know where it's coming from or where it's going. Um... There's no manual. You can, you can write a book and a manual and tell people how to answer the calling based on your experience, based on what you experience and how the Lord taught you to answer your calling. But that's not going to work for another guy. You are unique. It's mysterious. I could, re I could read all the books in the world about answering the call. And, even, and I'm sure I'm, I'll, I'll glean a lot of wisdom from all of that. But I cannot copy and paste the formulas and make a formula out of the thing. This is a personal, unique, anything is possible kind of relationship with God. And that element of the mystery and the unknown, we have to protect that. We have to cultivate it. We have to develop it. We have to nurture it. Because if we lose that and we become familiar with God, that's the sin of familiarity. When you're just familiar, oh, it's just Jesus. This is what happened with the, with the disciples. Jesus is walking and later on they got used to it. I mean, it's, just, it's Jesus. Um, they, they say things like, why did, why did she break the alabaster box and pour out the oil on your feet? We could have done this and this. It's just Jesus, you know. Um, and uh, But there's an element of that, that, that it's a sin of familiarity where we become familiar. And so God has made it in His divine wisdom and providence and sovereignty. He has put and in, involved an element of the unknown and of the mysterious that you cannot explain it. You cannot teach it. You cannot. Um, you can. You can't um, make a formula or a, or a thing about it. It's it's a unique. It's a once in a lifetime uh, thing. It's a it's a personal thing. It's it's something that you, when you experience His presence in new and unique and different ways, there's still the familiarity of Him. You know Him. You get to know Him better and better and better. But. There is an element where you've got to learn to accept it because you're not going to know everything all the time. And sometimes he'll keep quiet about something. And sometimes, they, and this is wonderful because it keeps it interesting. 
and there's an adventure. And if you don't have the sense of adventure in the presence of the Lord, then we're going to miss it in evangelism. And evangelism is something of an adventure. It's somewhat of an adventure that you go on and you engage and you go into the unknown and you don't know who to talk to and you don't know what's going to happen. You don't. You just go. You just show up. You jump into the deep end. You, you're thrown into the deep water. There you are. Now you've got to swim and you're scared. And it's and they're scary. There's, a, there's the butterflies in your stomach and it's and it's adrenaline pumping. Action. There's something happening now. And, and it's a thrill. It's a, you know, there's something. And, and this is the spirit of the Lord starts stirring up within you. And there is a conviction that stirs up in you. And there is a fire. And there is the roar of the Lion of Judah in you. And there is the... It's almost like the, the horse, a horse, a, a war horse that stands ready to charge into battle. The war, the war horse, and he knows what's coming. And because he's been through a few battles and he knows what's coming and the adrenaline starts pumping and his veins are standing like bulging like this. And his veins and, and the saltpeter is the sweat is making white. The salt is actually showing up on a horse's skin. You've got to see. When the adrenaline goes and the horse knows and he's about to charge and the horse goes like this. <laughs> you know, I like doing that. <laughs> there's something. There's this, there's a, and that's, that's the spirit. That's the groanings of the spirit. That's the fountains of the deep. And God is bringing us into the fountains because deep calls unto deep. There's a life. There's a, you're alive. You're not a, you're not a puppet. You're not a robot. You're not a, uh, you're not the, you don't, you are alive. You have your own personality. You've you got your own unique things. And there's the frontline ministries and your life could be on the line. Your life is actually in the hands of God. And you leave it there because it's the safest place. But there's something about standing up in the middle of a crowd. When it feels like it's inconvenient and it's not the right time to stand up and take charge of the atmosphere and say, excuse me, everybody, I want to tell you about Jesus Christ, the savior of the world, the one who saved my life. I have a personal relationship with him. He saved my life. He forgave my sin and what he did for me, he can do for you. And then to, to by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you've got to have that element. If, you, if that thing is missing in you, if that adventure, if that sense, I don't know what to call it excuse me man i don't know what to call it but there's something of an adventure and of an adrenaline rush like a thrill like a zeal like a passion like he stirs it up within you and the conviction takes hold of you and he takes over and then before long you see, you see and hear yourself doing and saying things that you've never heard yourself do and thought you would ever say and you walk into situations where where if you have to think about it You'll never walk into situations to preach the gospel. I've, 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 I've found myself in places and I thought to myself, man, where did you get yourself into today? Your life is, and I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm talking about gangsters with knives and all kinds of things. I, I'm talking about places, strange places, funny places, Muslims with rocks in their hands, ready to throw. And how the conviction of the Holy Spirit takes them. I mean, it's, you can't, sometimes you've got to get out of the familiar and out of the realm of the known. Because if you stay and abide in the realm of the known, you're going to miss the presence of God. You're going to miss the Shekinah glory of God. Because there, it's an eternal realm. It's an eternal, innumerable, inexhaustible, eternal, God-sized place in Him, in His heart. We anything is possible and that place is calling and that's the thing that that men men more than women maybe i don't know i've i've read a little bit of that book do you know you, you remember i think his name is john eldridge he wrote a book wild at heart for men and then <coughs> his wife <coughs> wrote another book he says a man wants there's something wild in a man And you want to quench that fire, that flame. That man becomes passive and dead and absent. And he dies. He dies before he, he's dead. Without losing his life, but he's dead inside. He's cold, hot, cold, callous. He died, he's passive. Because you want to quench him. You want to put him in a box. You want to put him in a lid and keep him tame. And tame. And you're taking, you're taking 
the wildness out and then what you're sitting with is an emasculated man that's sitting there that the, the wildness and the freedom is taken out of him and he's dead. That's not sons of God. I'm sorry, if you think a son of God walks around prim and proper with his suit, with a with like these Nancy's that's walking around these days. <laughs> I don't know what to call. And they all, but they're so lifeless and so, they're so passive and they can't, there's no fight in them anymore. There's no, there's no, there's nothing in you that wants to pray until something happens. You can't pray even for 10 minutes because you're dead and lifeless and cold and passive. Because the wildness and God made you wild. And I'm talking to men now. And women wants an adventure to share. So they want, they don't want to go alone on their own adventure. They want to share an adventure with us. And, uh, and a man wants to share the adventure as well. Beauty to conquer. Beautiful books. A lot of psychology, but there, there's a revelation in that. And it holds a key for a day such as this and a revival that we are on the brink of. There is a real relationship with God and it's vibrant and it's alive and it's wild, man. And it's, it's a fire. And it's beautiful. And it wins your heart every day. It's not a, mm, a boring, dull thing. And people's got this idea about Christianity. And it's dull and boring. It's not that. No. It's an adventure. And there's the unknown. And that's how the Lord wants it. And, but there is the revealing of the spirit. And the pro spirit of prophecy. That reveals to you these things. But, but something in you has got to want to jump out of the boat and walk on the water. That is life. God, God has breathed life. You're not dead. Live, man. Live. Live. You're not dead. You're not in prison. You're not, you can live. You've got freedom. There's freedom. And God wants you to live. And He wants you to roar. And He wants you to roar like a lion. And get up and live and speak the gospel and preach. And win souls. And go on an adventure and heal the sick and cast out devils and change your city for Christ, man. Hallelujah. And, and he wants to shake nations. And he, wa he wants you to live. you got to be alive. Don't be dead. There are times that you are tender. There's times that there's intimacy. You can't be on that level all the time. Whoa, you know, it's too much. But there are don't lose the fire. Don't lose the flame and don't put, quench the spirit. The word of God says, quench not the spirit. Quench not the spirit. We want to quench God. We want to quench the spirit, the fire, the all-consuming fire of God. We want to quench Him with the word of God in, in the sons of God. The, the spirit of God in the sons of God is crying out, don't quench the spirit of the sons of God. Hallelujah. Don't quench the spirit. Don't quench the Spirit of God. It's not just talking about grieving Him. It's talking about quenching Him, quenching Him. He's a fire. He's wild. Don't quench Jesus. Don't put Him in a box. Don't say, oh, oh, quiet down. Oh, keep quiet. No, He's the one that curses a fig tree and goes and makes a whip and goes alone, man alone. He goes into the temple and throws over all the tables and people are scared of Him. And He has a whip. He says, You've made my father's house a den of thieves. My father's house shall be called a, a house of prayer for all nations. And he was there was the zeal. Then they remembered of the scripture that said, the zeal of my God has consumed me. He goes, Jesus shows up at the, at the tomb of Lazarus and he stands in the tomb and the word says he wept and he, and he breathed. Hey, let's go there. Maybe we must read it. I don't know which... Which chapter? Maybe you guys got to Google it. I'm not sure. One of the one of the books. Forget about it. I'll we'll go to that. One of the scriptures there. One of the references says he breathed violently. Maybe we must go there. Do you mind? Just Google where Jesus stands at the tomb of Lazarus, where he's about to raise Lazarus from the dead. I think John is the right one. There's a few references to it, but. I believe John, just help me, where's John, where's the one in John? And Luke, probably Luke is also the right one. So, so I'm waiting for the scripture reference where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Give me one in every gospel, in all the different gospels, uh, 
the references and so on, because I'm looking for something specific. Jesus stands in the tomb and one of the translations says that he breathed heavily and there was a, there was a groaning in the spirit. There was, there was life in him. God's not, what's the right word? Passive, absent. John 11, I'm sure it is. Thanks. Thought so. Thought so. <clears throat> Take away the stone. He cried with a loud voice. There was one way he says Jesus wept and then is there any other uh, translation uh, any other reference he says verse 43 let John 11 43 he shouted with a loud voice Lazarus come out he shouted he cried with a loud voice amen that's 38 verse 244 is there another reference? I'm looking for something specific. But I know I've heard I've heard the one uh, Prophet Kubus von Hensburg actually had a whole sermon on this. That the, the word there that, that he says that he cried with a loud voice. Lazarus come forth. It actually says there a heaving, a groaning in the spirit, like a like a horse that's ready to charge into battle that goes like this. <sighs> that like a I, I, I don't want to <laughs> try and look like a horse today or sound like one. But this, if you can hear what I'm saying. And you know how many men feel uh, they, 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 like there's no place for them in the church because quiet, quiet, quiet. And they want to, and you've got to do this and you've got to act like this and you can't do this and you do, 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 do. And it's like the churches are emasculate, like if you hear what I'm saying, like they are quenching the spirits of men where the, the, they just want you to be. And this is a zombie. This is basically what the world deep one world government and deep state thing. This is basically what they want. And I have seen the videos where they have had meetings in the World Health Organization and health places because they are trying to and they have uh, identified the gene that is prevalent in radical Muslims and radical um, religious fanatics okay they have actually identified that gene but it's not Christianity they because this is real this is coming from a lot but if there is a religious belief and somebody believes something so much that they're willing to give their life for it, even if they're wrong. There is a specific gene and certain people are more prone to, to be radical and go to the fanatical side. And they have actually identified the gene and they have the drug to introduce to these people that will actually alter that genetic code the rna of that the it actually alters that very rna this is huh what do they call this man i forgot the name uh this genetics and and they've got actually they are actually now working on altering human dna and re relieving and, and releasing the dna and, and um rectifying and Taking out the sicknesses in your DNA strength. And they are doing that. They have drugs to do that. you got to go and check it out. It's a specific word that they use. I can't remember what they call it. But it's very, very well known. So they have discovered this. And so there's a prophecy of Bob Jones. I don't know if you know Bob Jones. The prophecy the Lord showed him years and years and years ago. About three things that were supposed to happen. And he said the first two things happened. But the third thing, and this is just before he died, his prophecy about the billion soul harvest and all that. 
Bob Jones said that there was one thing that the Lord showed him that he hasn't seen in his lifetime. And this is what the Lord showed him, that there would be a chemical introduced that will make people like zombies. It will sear their conscience and it will kill their conscience and people will be controllable. And the governments of the world is introducing once and is looking for a way to introduce this chemical into the general population so that they can be manageable and controllable and they'll do exactly what they told to do. It wants to kill the fire. It wants to quench the spirit. And you have that same spirit that wants to quench the spirit in churches and denominations all over the world in religious, dead, religious, passive denominations and churches and whatever organizations that there is such a, a passivity and a timidity and a, and a death there that there's no life it's like a it's a it's like a funeral now that there's a spirit behind that that wants to control and manipulate now look now think and bob jones died just after he shared this he has actually got the video if i can get the clip i'll put it on <clears throat> He says that the only thing that hasn't happened before this great revival was that there was this chemical and he didn't know how it worked or what it would do or what. But he saw this vision, I mean, like 40 years ago when he was called into ministry. He was caught up and he saw this. And he said, everything has happened just as the Lord showed me. And he goes through all the stuff. I can't remember everything. But there was the one thing that the governments and the they want to introduce a chemical that will make people like zombies, that will make people, that's, that's exactly, that's exactly about Bill Gates and all this and the, the other thing they call it is now the Agenda 21 and I don't know what this Conan, Conan Q thing nonsense is, I don't know what, it, what that is, but the word of the, the, the Lord will reveal all kinds of stuff and then, let me tell you something. If you have been around for a while and you know how the world works, then when you hear some theories that's, that's, um, that's so terrible, it sounds so terrible, like, Yo, is this really what's going on in the world? It's, it's so heavy and so ridiculous that most of the times it's true. It's prob it's, and, and there is... And probably they want to now introduce a vaccine. And I'm not saying don't take the vaccine. When you are born again, it cannot quench the spirit of God in you. It cannot kill. And this is what the devil wants to do. He wants to make people brain dead like zombies. It's a spiritual thing. The chemical will not. He says if you take up anything deadly, it will do you no harm. You will take up serpents and they will shake it off. And you'll take and you'll drink. And he says it's not what goes into a man that defiles a man, what, what comes out of a man. But there is a spirit behind this, a spirit of passivity that wants to quench the spirit and quench the fire of God. And I mean, I'm talking, I see men. I see men walking around and they're walking with like dogs be, with their tails between their legs. I see this in South Africa. I see this amongst people all over. And there's a, there's a spirit that wants to that wants to suffocate the wildness. And I mean, I'm not talking about irresponsible wildness. I'm not talking about mad, crazy. I mean, there's a line, <laughs> you know, but there's something that that's inside of you. And especially when you're born again, where you have a, th a thirst for the unknown, a thirst for exploration, a thirst for adventure, a thirst to go fishing. To see what's going on beneath the surface, in the depths. There's something unknown about fishing. I love fishing. A lot of men like fishing. Women too. I'm not. <laughs> so, now you're fishing. Why? You want to see what's beneath the surface. You in, you, you, it's mosquito. You, you're curious. There's a, a sense of curiosity that mustn't be quenched. But if you leave that curiosity... For on its own and you don't satisfy it with the presence of God that curiosity will get you into trouble if you don't satisfy you got to know that the presence of God 
is what satisfies that thirst for adventure in a man and that wildness and that uh, that um, that curiosity that um, that sense of adventure the thrill of the hunt the thrill of the chase the the thrill in, and then and, and there's something about it I, I don't know I know many people you know uh, that was when I was young I, 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 I want to say no man it's 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 not about age it's a spirit it's a heart how free is your heart man and I I, I feel like I want to preach but this isn't really I'll go and check out all the but but Samson shook himself the spirit of the Lord came on he took a donkey's jawbone and killed a thousand Philistines David goes in and he goes <laughs> and chops off the foreskins of I don't know how many hundreds of Philistines by himself in the night what kind of a man is he I mean the mighty men of David how they fought that their hands clung and became one with their swords you got to fight hard for your hand to become one with your sword. That the hand clung to the sword. That they had to pry it open. That's how hard he fought. Killing many. <laughs> now, I don't go and kill people. But how about we, we are excited about evangelism. How about there's a fire and a passion in the church that kills the passivity and the timidity and the absent the absentness and the whatever you want to call it the death deadness and we call it this a revival of love is this not a revival is this not a fanning of the flame is this not a breathing upon the dying coals and the embers of your heart <sighs> and so that there will be fire again in your life man you got to live most people are just satisfied and they're content with just existing. But Jesus doesn't want you to just exist. He wants you to live and have life and that more abundantly. We're so bogged down with worrying and stress and fear and anxiety and um, torment and worrying about the future and, and double-mindedness. God says, don't worry. Sufficient unto the days, the evil thereof. How can you not worry about tomorrow? Because there's an unknown. Then you can worry about tomorrow and the next year as much as you want. But that's not going to bring, because you don't know. And God doesn't reveal it all to us. Because that'll take, that'll spoil the fun. Isn't it? <clears throat> God doesn't spoil, uh, spoiler alert, we win. <laughs> you know, the God said we win. We read the end of the book. So we know we, at least we win, we secure. But now enjoy and I think that, you know, we have an enemy and the enemy comes and no weapon formed against us will be able to prosper. But here comes enemies and he's they're attacking and you going through wildernesses and you're going through like spiritual battles and things and, oh, and you're going and it's, and it's not fun. And it's, but you, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, there's got to be something in you that looks at the giants and say, give me the giants. They are bred to me. That's the roar of the lion of Judah standing up. That's the all-consuming fire. He spoke as one having authority with conviction. Not as the Pharisees. He spoke as if he knew what he was talking about. There was life in him. He's alive. He's not this gentle, tender Jesus with the lamb under his arm. He's a man. Well, he is a man. You know, 100% man, 100% God. <laughs> so, so there is the humanity of Jesus. But there, there is life. He's, he smiled. I'm sure he had fun. I'm sure they, they enjoyed the sunsets and the oceans and the waves. I mean, this is Jesus. He goes to sleep in the middle of a storm on a boat. And they're busy dying and they're freaking out. It was a little bit rough for them. Oh, Jesus! Don't you care that we're perishing? Jesus is like, ooh, this is awesome. I mean, he's sleeping, man. That's, he is so in, uh, just absolutely anchored, rooted and grounded in confidence of who his father God is. That in the midst of a storm, you know, he gets up, he says, oh, you have little faith. Peace be still. And the storms stop. The waves come. Now people will say, well, 
Maybe he was, wasn't he prophetic enough to know that the storm is coming and they should rather go tomorrow morning? No, Jesus knew. Of course he knew the storm was coming. And they said, he still said, let's go to the other side. He got into the boat and he fell asleep. And they're going and here's the storm coming. Jesus sometimes sends you into the storm. He sends you in the wilderness. He sends you on the street corner to stand up there. And you look like whatever. People think, what? Who's the? And you stand up and you say, excuse me. Jesus saved my soul. And he sent me here to tell you that he loves you. And I want to pray for you. And he can make you whole. And he can change your life. And he can breathe life into you. And he loves you. And he died in your place so that you can live. This conviction, this authority, this wildness this life in you this is what i mean jesus walks on the water and then he calls peter to do the same <laughs> it's awesome <clears throat> and go fish peter there's gonna be a gold coin in the fish that you catch a gold coin in its mouth go and fish there's a there's a gold coin in it what I want to see this, <laughs> you know, there's adventures. And if you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, God loves miraculous things. He loves supernatural. He loves miracles, signs and wonders. Everywhere, everywhere, the whole book, the whole book, the whole Bible, the whole word of God is full of signs, wonders and miracles. Axe heads that float. The Red Sea that splits up locusts. And frogs and the water turns to blood uh, in, the, in, in Egypt. And a pillar of fire by night and a cloud, of, a cloud by day. A pillar. <laughs> I mean, manna from heaven, bread out of nothing, raining down from heaven. Water from a rock. This is the God that we serve. There is an element of the unknown and you've got to know that when you go into the presence of the Lord, sometimes you've got to, there's got to be something in you that says, give me the giants. They are meat. They are bread to me. There's got to be, you've got to rise. There's got to be the Christ man rising up in you and saying, give me the desert. Give me the mountain. Because I'm 85. But I'm still as young as I was 40. Give me the mountains, Caleb. Caleb. Give me the deserts. Because with God, nothing is impossible. There's something in, there's something that's, that the devil wants to snuff out. He wants to, he wants to quench it. He wants to limit you. He wants to suffocate you. He wants to bind you. He wants to imprison you and captivate and kept. Take you, take you captive and put you in bondage and break your heart and put you in a mold. And if we don't know, if we don't know how to treat our and what, how to prophesy, woman of God, I'm talking to you, prophesy life and see your husband differently. See him through the eyes of God. Don't quench his, don't break him. Don't break him. Amen. That's a word for somebody. You're breaking your sons. I don't walk around with condemnation. You know, sometimes you just got to let them be boys. Let them wrestle. Let them wrestle with the angel. God's not scared. God's not nervous. He's not nervous. Heaven is not nervous. You know, we're walking around as if everybody's nervous. Oh, we got to walk around on our toes like we're walking on eggshells. And you go to just, hey man, relax. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's the word for tonight. And this is all, everything to do about the presence of the Lord. And as you continue to go into the presence, there will be times that your life gets a little bit interesting. So don't wonder what's going on. Just continue to trust God. Because He's going to take you on. Then sometimes it's a little bit of a roller coaster. But enjoy the ride. Huh? Close your eyes. He wants to take you and some of you are coming through some wildernesses. Some of you are coming through the valley of the shadow of death. And you know what's the good news? God is still with you and he's going to bring you out and you're going to have a testimony that will shock people into the kingdom. When you tell them how faithful God has been and the things that you've gone through, look at life as an adventure with Jesus because he's taking you on an adventure with him. And sometimes it looks a little bit scary. 
Sometimes it looks like Pharaoh's army is coming and they're going to kill us now. And yes, suddenly the sea opens up. This is the kind of God we say. You've got to know him. You've got to know that element of Jesus. You've got to know the element, that specific characteristic trait, character trait of the Father and of Jesus and of the Holy Spirit. That's, that's, you've got to know that. You, you can't, um, you can't put him in a box. You can't do that. No, 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 no. Um, amen. Do you hear what I'm saying? Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. I love you, Father. We give you all the praise and all the glory. Amen and amen. And we're going to see some wild ones. Some wild ones rising up on fire. On fire that will walk in and the gates of hell shall not prevail against them. They'll go where angels fear to tread. They'll go in there with the power and the authority of the word of God, the name of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb and the Spirit of God. And they're going to go there with power, signs, wonders, miracles. They're going to change cities and shake nations. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. What a word, Father. And I needed this word. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. So I'm going to anoint you. And you, woman, there's rising up. And let me tell you, you're going to show some men how to how to fight you're gonna you can show you some of you can show and teach some guys how to live because there's a thirst for life and a zeal and a passion for god in you and no matter how much satan has thrown on you he could not quench that fire and i tell you tonight the lord is saying that a broken reed i will not break and a smoking flax i will not quench if there's just a little bit of hope God says, I am reviving you and you're going to come out of timidity and passivity and feeling like Satan's walking all over you and you just have no way out. And he's just every time and he's God's going to take what the devil meant for evil and turn it around for good. And he's going to bring his glory and he's going to change it for his glory. He's going to bring glory out of that situation. No matter how much he threw at you, no matter how much Satan in the world threw at you. And I mean, you've gone through it. You should have been could have, should have been dead long time ago. The fact that you're still here is an absolute miracle from the hand of God. You are a miracle on two legs walking around. You're a miracle, a living, breathing, testifying miracle walking around. It's the devil's, I can just see the devil sitting with his hands on his head saying, I don't know what to do anymore. I tried everything. I just can't kill. I just can't break them. They just get up again and they go on and they preach again and they prophesy again and they teach again. And that's something of the Spirit of God. There's a relentlessness. There's a, a stickability. A, a resurrection power that just... You can't fail. Even if you're dead, you, you raised up from the dead. If, I mean, you just can't fail that. You've got to know that you're in the spirit and you are in God. And God wants to take you into, and his word will not return void. And sometimes there's miracles. And I pray that the Lord will release miracles into your life. Amen. So that's an element and that's, that's something. And this is very important to have because then if you are in your, comfortable in your own skin and you are, you are free to be you. That's where true intimacy can take place. That's if you're not, if you are insecure in your identity and who you are and you're timid and intimidated by the devil all the time. You're intimidated by religiosity and institutions and denominationalism and all this crap. You intimidate walking around. You don't know who you are. How are you going to be yourself in intimacy with Jesus? People have a problem with intimacy because they can't be themselves. They don't know who they are. You've got to be free. You, God wants you to rise up and be free and mature. And then the intimate times with the Father. Beyond what you... But you have to have that. Otherwise you're going to be... 
You, you can't be an insecure person in the intimate bed, in the intimate chambers, the bedroom, intimacy, fellowship time with the Lord on a spiritual level. I'm talking. And so there in that glory cloud, when you are insecure and you intimidate it and you're passive and weak and frail and because of the world, but you can't enjoy intimacy and he won't come and he won't force intimacy. That's not who he is. He's a gentleman. He wants you well. He wants you healed. He wants you to be alive as a born again believer. And when you're there, then, then the time is right for intimacy. Then the time is right. Don't awaken love until it pleases. The Lord is going to awaken love, but you got to realize you, you, you go into the presence, get into the presence of the Lord and and there will be times where the roar of the Lion of Judah will roar through you and people will be scared and people will run and people will not understand. Jesus, why are you making a whip? Jesus, why are you overturning the tables? What's going on? Jesus, this isn't like you. Jesus, you must repent. Jesus, No, I can just see him roaring. And then he starts screaming and say, you brood of vipers. You synagogue of Satan. <laughs> Come on, man. He didn't stand back. He was wild. He was real. Amen. Without sin. It's beautiful. We're going to see some, some wild ones, some pioneers, some frontliners, some adventurists, you know, prophets of God rising up in this day and age. And don't, don't freak out. Don't... Uh, um, God's grace, God's mercy. I mean, there's some guys wild. I, I visited with some missionaries. Brother, you get there and you think, man, I wonder if this guy's saved. But he's winning souls and he's going and his life is on the line every single day. In the front lines in Muslim countries, undercover, they, nobody knows that their missionary is there. They're there and they're wild, brother. You're going to think, oh man, this guy, this isn't... No. That's who God uses there. Because the prim and proper guy with his suit and his Rolex and his what, 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 what. And all his connections and his fancy cars and his nice and all that. Every, and it's wonderful to have fancy cars. Amen. I'm not talking against that Lord. Thank you Jesus for my fancy cars coming. You know, but we're too civilized to go and do what God tells you to do. And you won't last a week there. So don't judge people on how they act and how they look and how rough they are. Maybe they are a little rough around the edges. But if you've spent some time in the front lines, you know, you don't have time for bull. You don't have time for little nonsense. You know, you, you know your God. And um, He knows you. And um, so, yeah, it's a journey. And we're going we're gonna to get there. And, and this... This generation, I'm talking about holy people that is absolutely anointed by God to be holy, more holy by accident than they ever tried to be on purpose. It's real, real, real. It's going to come. So here's the oil. So I anoint you with the fires of the Holy Spirit to be rekindled in your life so that wherever you have quenched the Spirit, wherever you have put a lid on certain things where people have told you, hey man, settle down, quiet down. This is a time to be quiet. This is a time to settle down. No, no, no. It's a time to roar. Hallelujah. It's a time to preach the gospel. It's a time to pray for the sick. It's a time to be public with Jesus. It's a time to make your voice known in the name of, but don't do it in the flesh. Oh man, don't do it in the flesh. Do it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Let Him inspire you. Then you're going to roar. Then things are going to change. Okay, so be real. I anoint you and I bring you forgiveness in the name of Jesus for the times that you have quenched your spirit or you have allowed people to quench your spirit where you second guess yourself every time you want to prophesy or you got a scripture to share to somebody but because somebody ridiculed you, somebody quenched your fire and put you down and dismissed whatever you had to say, it feels like your, vo your voice has been stolen, like you have no more self-esteem and confidence and assurance and and boldness with the Lord. And this is what they fasted and prayed for, for Paul and Barnabas, to have boldness to preach the gospel. 
Wherever people has, has put out the fire in you and you've allowed it, I pray the Lord bring you the fire and rekindle the, fire, the flames in your heart in Jesus' name and that there will be a revival of the fire of God in your life. A revival, a revival, a refire, a reflame, a rekindle, a refresh, a renew, a refire in Jesus' mighty name. Shega Bagadezo. Thank you, Lord. I take that word. I take that anointing in the name of Jesus. Amen. People, you're getting healed. You're getting set free. Hallelujah. You're going to be a fire, wildfire. Amen. Led by the Lord. 100% committed and yielded and surrendered to the control of the Holy Spirit. Then you're dangerous. Amen. Then you're dangerous. Hallelujah, man. Thank you, Jesus. Do you have your communion elements ready? I always give an opportunity these days to sow into Loveborn. And this is the ministry banking details. Here is the PayPal details. Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen. So the church is coming out of the closet. <laughs> That's one of the best things I heard Kubus von Rensburg say. Says, it's time for the church to come out of the closet. <laughs> Get out, man. Why are you hiding? Why are you ashamed? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're going to be ashamed. They're on their way to hell. They're deceiving people. They're rubbing their filth in the media, in the movies. You can't even hardly look at a movie these days unless you see some gay uh, right nonsense or some pro-abortion nonsense crap that's coming on there and they're rubbing it in your face man and when you stand up and tell them about Jesus they want you to make to f want you to feel intimidated huh you don't have anything to be ashamed about we will not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ we'll preach the gospel we'll pray for the sick we'll cast out devils we'll get the sick and the captives set free in Jesus mighty name amen Amen. I'd like Uncle Angus. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. That's my mom drew. Bless you as you sow. I call in your harvest in Jesus' mighty name. Take the communion elements. Do you have it? Amen. So I don't know. Uh, maybe some people will have a problem with the Christmas tree. I don't use it. A lot of people are celebrating Christmas all over the world. Most don't even know what it's about. So whatever. Tell them what it's about. Tell them about Jesus. This is a good time to tell people about Jesus. Amen. So bless you. Thank you, Lord. While you were watching this, I pray that the passion and the fire and the expectation and the thrill and the zeal of God that the Lord has blessed me with, the level that He's blessed, I pray that it has ignited something in you and that there was a supernatural importation and a transfer of the fire of the Holy Spirit upon you. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for your blood. <laughs> Hallelujah. Whew. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Bless you. Bless you, Jesus. Oh, 
Shower us with your gentleness now and your peace and comfort. Bring us peace, Lord. Bring us rest. Bring us your mercies and your grace, your tender loving kindness, your mercies, your goodness, your kindness, your kindness, your kindness. Oh, you're so kind, Lord. For your love that conquers the world. Bless you, Lord. Thank you for that love. Amen. Amen, Aline. Thank you. Bless you. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. I'll see you tomorrow afternoon at 4 p.m. So not tomorrow, 11 a.m. We're not going to have any uh, broadcast, but tomorrow afternoon at 4 p.m. We're going to pray in tongues and we're going to put to practice a lot of the things that we learned. And I hope that you are still enjoying this journey into the manifest presence. Maybe there's a few things that you haven't thought of. and Maybe there's some new things that you, that the Lord is teaching you because he's taking us deeper. Amen. So bless you and thank you for listening. I appreciate you and I love you.